Open your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9. We'll be looking into verses 19 through 31. And of course, our hope and desire is that verses 19 through 31 will be looking into us because the word is alive. I'm calling this teaching a learning curve. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that we could jump right into it. Father, I'm reminded that your word says that you said, Lord, you will seek for me and you will find me when you seek for me with all your heart. And so, Lord, that's what we want to do right now. Holy Spirit, take the word and apply it to our hearts individually. You know what we need. So bless us with your word in this time. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. And all my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen. All right. All right. In our last exciting episode, and that's what the book of Acts is like. One exciting episode after another as the new, brand new church gets started. The New Testament church. And we watched last week as Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul, had his Damascus Road experience where he was knocked down, where he was blinded by a bright light that came to him out of heaven. I like to call it a bolt of enlightenment. And I think a lot of people need a bolt of enlightenment. Amen? Maybe we should be praying for that. Um, where we he ended up confessing at that point, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's an attitude that we all need to hang on to. Don't let that wane from your life, but hang on to that. Lord, what do you want me to do? The conversion of Saul of Tarsus was dramatic. That's for sure. It was powerful. It was a true conversion as well as a total shock since he originally was the prime hater of the church and of believers. His dramatic conversion brought to us arguably the best teacher ever in the Apostle Paul. Now, often we like to jump from Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul, don't we? Without considering the intervening years and the learning curve that he had to go through. Those are the things that I want to take into consideration today. And like all of us, for Saul of Tarsus, there were trials. There were troubles, uh, some growth, some ministry, and some letdowns. As a matter of fact, we're going to take a look at a letdown, literally, of Saul of Tarsus. You see, Saul had this point set out on the very same path that you and I are on, that of learning and obedience and trusting God and growing in our faith. And there's no substitute for those things. And they don't seem to happen overnight. And I think as we've discussed before, has anybody had that thing where you're praying in church and you go, oh Lord, just do it all to me right now. Just, just do it all. <laughs> and that doesn't work, does it? I think we, a lot of us have tried that and that's not how the Lord wants us to grow. So uh, you could say, for many of us, we seem to learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. Anybody with me on that one? <laughs> the school of hard knocks, I think is what it's called. So it's not a surprise to fail. It's not a surprise to fall. As a matter of fact, as a believer, if you've never failed and you've never fallen, I would say that's really weird. <laughs> I've never heard of that. And it's certainly not the case for Saul of Tarsus. It's not the case to not be let down by the church, as Saul of Tarsus will be let down in just a moment. 
Not to be let down in ministry. Not to have things happen. It's not a surprise to even find yourself a basket case. Which is where we're going to find Saul of Tarsus, literally a basket case from time to time. We all should, I, here's what I think. I think we should daily delight in the God of second chances. And for a lot of us, if you're like me, I generally burn out that second chance by, you know, before, well before 10 a.m., you know, well before my first cup, second cup of coffee anyway. So, so, oh, how important then, here's a valuable part and a lesson I want us to take away from this. Oh, how important then are those people, those wonderful saints of God that he puts in our path to encourage us, to lift us up, when we get let down, to put an arm around us when our hearts are broken, when things don't go as we think they ought to go, when we find ourselves in a place where we're not understanding God at all. We can all go there, can't we? And we need encouragers in the church to help us out. When people will write us off, when people will let us down or have nothing to do with us. And I will add even more than wanting to and desiring to and being thankful for other people encouraging you. Oh my goodness. There is a world of ministry if you will just become one of God's encouragers. I uh, spoke with a lady yesterday. Uh, that I had not met before, uh, actually a good friend of Judy's. And uh, she was saying that very same thing, how encouraging the word of God is to her, how encouraging it is for her to hear somebody speak about the Lord and what God wants to do in their lives. And, and that was just awesome uh, to hear her. And her saying how she's encouraged actually encouraged me. So this whole encouraging thing is a very contagious thing within the church family. There's a whole world of ministry in encouraging others. That's a good, that's a good one, isn't it? The, there's a whole world of, encourage, of encouragement ministry. Join that ministry. In fact, uh, we should put that in announcements. Uh, the church would like to sign up some more people to be encouragers. Uh, you're welcome to join the encouragement team. So, uh, which leads us to our verses today, uh, which follow the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, later to become the Apostle Paul. You will remember from our last lesson that a good brother by the name of Ananias, he came along and he put his arm on Saul and he said to him, Brother Saul, the Lord has sent me to you. Well, what a great thing to happen in our lives, to be that person that God uses to lift up other people in their faith. So not only was Ananias used by God to do that. And by the way, anybody remember the meaning of the name Ananias? Literally, the name means whom God has graciously given. And God graciously gave Ananias the encourager to uh, Saul of Tarsus. Perfect name for that brand new Christian to help him out. The Lord worked at Ananias to receive him as a brother uh, in Christ, to restore Saul's sight, to lay hands on him so that he received the Holy Spirit, and then to baptize him. What a cool ministry Ananias has had. And we don't talk nearly enough about the Ananiases of the world, do we? I think we're going to kind of do that today. So please follow along now as I read Acts chapter 9, verses 19 and 25, as we continue our journey through the Word of God. Here we go. So when he, Saul, had received food, remember he didn't eat or drink anything for three days, he was so shook after giving his life to Christ, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard 
were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name, that's the name of Jesus, in Jerusalem, and has come here for that purpose, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. Let's stop there for a moment. Uh, the first thing that we find is that this new believer, Saul, is hanging out with other believers. What's that called? Fellowship. fellowship. How important is fellowship? It's crucial. It's crucial, huh? So, sometimes, you know, let's say, God forbid, you miss a service. If you'll just call another believer and just talk to him for a little bit, you'll be encouraged. Just because you know what they know, they know what you know, they know what they face every day and what you face as a follower in Jesus Christ. We need fellowship. We need that oneness. Uh, yeah, praise God. So uh, what a shocking change for him. This very one that had once gone after the church to imprison or to martyr believers what a shock. And now he's a part of the church family. <laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? You sit next to somebody say, hey, hey, bro, uh, it's cool. I haven't seen you at church before. Thanks for coming in. Uh, by the way, what did you used to do for a living? Kill Christians. <laughs> He'd say, excuse me, I'm moving to another seat right now. That was his, that was his testimony. This is crazy. Uh, so a total shock. We are told that he was with them for some days. We're not told what some days equates to, but he's there in fellowship with them for some days. And then we're given this amazing word regarding Saul of Tarsus, and it is the word immediately. Look at verse 20. Immediately. That means post haste, <laughs> without delay. <laughs> Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, can somebody tell me, if you know, in God's plan for Saul of Tarsus, who was to be the number one group that he was to minister to? That's right. Okay, there we go. He was the Gentile preacher, wasn't he? Yes. But we find him here preaching to the Jews. So we're going to find out how that went. <laughs> you might call this a case of the right word, but in the wrong place for him. And God does have a place for each one of us. Absolutely true. And wherever it is that God places you, that's where you are to grow. Grow where God plants you, following God's instructions for living. If you do that, you'll stay on track. If you don't, you'll flounder. And unfortunately, I recently talked with a couple of people and I'm like, where are you going to church? Well, we're not right now. Okay. How about your kids? Where are they going to church? Oh, well, they're not right now. It just breaks my heart. Absolutely. You know, I, I heard, well, we're looking for a church. Okay, somebody tell me, how long does it take to look for a church? <laughs> not very long, huh? So, look, you've been called to walk with Jesus. And you've been called to walk with Jesus with other believers. 
So find a place where you can fellowship. That's what Saul did when he first got saved. And he wanted to talk about Jesus, who he is, what he's done. That's your job. Now, now look, I realize now at my age, I seem to be talking to more and more grandparents and uh, great grandparents as well. And I'm finding out that their job is to share their faith, I think, at this point, primarily with their grandkids. Any grandparents realize that? Okay, you're on God's green earth to minister to, to encourage, to lead your grandkids to know Jesus Christ. So uh, here we are. Saul seems to be on track. Uh, he says immediately he began to preach, but he's doing it in the synagogues. Uh, but I'll tell you what. At the same time I was thinking that, I was thinking to myself, I don't want to particularly step out and fault uh, Saul of Tarsus, right? I, I don't want to fault him. He doesn't have any lack of faith. I mean, he's ready to go. Or, or to say that in any way he's ashamed of following Jesus Christ. That's not true at all. So remember, again, though, that we're not talking about Paul the Apostle. We're talking about Saul of Tarsus, a brand new believer in the faith. But he has no fault as far as zeal is concerned. So, uh, yet, uh, look at him preaching Jesus as the Messiah. He's telling everybody, this is the one that we have been waiting for. He is the very Son of God. And the Jews knew that when you spoke like that about Jesus, what you were literally talking about is the deity of Jesus Christ. You're literally, literally confirming he is God with us. Wow, is that foundational to our faith or what? And that's exactly what Saul went after. Look, all who heard, it says, were amazed. And I'm considering that that included both believers and non-believers. Everybody's amazed at this guy. Verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed? Don't you just like stop on that word destroyed? This is, we're talking about Saul the destroyer. That's who he was. Destroyed those who called on the name of Jesus in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. So imagine you being there in Damascus. And there you are on the Sabbath in service. And you're a believer. And in walks Saul the destroyer. What would you be thinking if you walked in the room right now? You'd be going red alert, right? Red alert. Shock. Let's get out of here as quick as we can. You know, look who this is. This can't be Saul the destroyer. Now all of a sudden, Saul the disciple of Jesus Christ. Verse 22, but Saul increased all the more. Look what he increased in. He increased in strength. It's interesting. And he confounded. So he's like powerful and a confounder of others, of the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, let's think about Saul for a moment. <laughs> Later on, we're going to find out that Saul is a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's got the pedigree. He was doing his very best to be the very best Pharisee ever. He was on the Sanhedrin, the leading council of the Jews. He was first in line to say, let's get those who are of the way. Let's get rid of them. So he's got all this power, but he's using it to confound. I found that interesting. Is it your desire ever to confound people? It's interesting, isn't it? I think on one hand, if somebody was confounded by your change in lifestyle, that would be a compliment, right? 
But if you just wanted to, you know, be a debater and, and to kind of confound somebody with how wise you were, well, that would be a lot more difficult, wouldn't it? And I don't know that that would be what the Lord would want. Thank you, Ginger. You're the best. I have the best wife in the whole world. I feel sorry for the rest of you unmarried guys. I got the last good one. <laughs> I'm definitely one of those guys who married up. <laughs> Better than I deserve, that's for sure. So, uh, let's see, where was I now? 23. 23, 23. Look at 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. So he's got a lot of strength. He has the ability to confound anybody he debates with. And he's literally able to prove from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. That's pretty cool stuff, but I still have to ask myself, is this where God wants him? Is this where this brand new believer, Saul, is meant to be? I'm just questioning it. Like I say, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, I, I, you got to love this guy, Saul. <laughs> I mean, he totally, completely abandons his life to follow Jesus Christ. There is nothing holding him back. Now, he pretty much doesn't care about anything else except being the best servant of Jesus that he can be. He is, I would call at this point, he's a growing giant of the faith. Uh, he's a reasoning genius. Uh, but like all of us, he's going to take steps and he's going to take missteps. And he, like all of us, must daily recognize our desperate need for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Your day is going to go a lot better, guaranteed, if you wake up in the morning, say hello to God your Father, and ask the Holy Spirit to please lead you. Lead your mouth. Lead your steps. It's going to be a lot better for you and me. <laughs> He must have been all over the scriptures, don't you think? And I thought, okay, where, where was Paul in the scriptures? And I thought to myself, okay, he for sure was in Isaiah 61, which says the job description of the Messiah and how Jesus lines up with that. He for sure was in Isaiah 53, which is the prophecy of Jesus' death upon the cross 700 years before it took place. And he for sure was in Psalm 22. Also, it looks like an eyewitness to the crucifixion about 900 years before the death of Jesus Christ. I think he was like, the word of God was continually lighting up for him. And don't you love it? And for sure I love it. When the word of God lights up for you. Don't you? There's been times in the house, you can ask my wife, where I'll, I'll yell across the house, Oh, Jeannie, I understand this. <laughs> That's just the Lord showing. He, he wants to show you what his word means. And he wants to show you how it applies to your life. We don't serve a God who is playing hide and seek. You know, we are playing we are praying to, praising, and directing our hearts towards a God who wants to reveal himself to us. So, uh, I'm always amazed, continually amazed, at just how powerfully Jesus can change a person's life. And he can change your life even more than he already has. And he wants to. So that people will say, what are you up to and what's going on? Yesterday, I just had a guy come up to me out of the blue, and he goes, um, you're a pastor, right? And I said, yeah, I am. 
And he began to tell me about a situation that's going on in his family. And so I said, brother, let's pray about it right now. I put my arm around him and we prayed. And I thought, okay, Lord, thank you for that assignment. That was really cool, Lord. And I know that the Holy Spirit led me in that. And I, I walked away from there with a smile on my face saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Now, that's supposed to happen to each one of us. And I think on a regular basis. And not to be a surprise, but where we actually end up saying, oh, okay, Lord, I got you. I'll pray for this one, or I'll say that, or I'll share with that one. That's God's plan for your life. <laughs> Absolutely. That's why you're here to hear this today. So, uh, look, we're changed. Uh, we're not perfect, right? But we are forgiven. Saul of Tarsus, not perfect, especially as a brand new believer. But he's forgiven. And he's on the road like you and me. And the God who called you has every plan to complete in your life to prepare you to meet Jesus Christ. I don't know if you, let me say that again. You are going to come face to face with Jesus Christ. I don't know, what does that do for you? It's like, me, it's a little dizzy. I'm honest with you. Hello, Jesus. <laughs> That's God's plan for you and for me. And meantime, the Holy Spirit then is forming us in this image of Jesus Christ uh, we're supposed to be reflectors of God and his goodness. And if you become a reflector of God and his goodness, don't you think people will look at you and say, you're a Christian, aren't you? Let me, can you pray for me? Or let me tell you what's going on in my life. And then you know to pray and you know to minister and you're ready to jump in there with both feet. Okay, Paul the Apostle would later write in the book of Galatians, this is like a side note, that uh, his increase in strength came from three years that he spent out in the desert. Did you all know that? Paul the Apostle went out to the desert, the Arabian desert, <laughs> for three years. Some people think that he went as far as Mount Sinai. Went up the hill where Moses got the Ten Commandments and the law. And during that time, he spent time with Jesus and the Word of God. And that alone time with Jesus transformed him even all the more. He began to grow in his faith there. It seemed like Saul of Tarsus out in the desert learned a devotional life, if you will, that carried along with him all the days of his life. So now, will those who are amazed by the strength and ability to confound and to prove that Jesus is the Christ from Saul of Tarsus, will they now believe? Look at verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know if you'd call it a successful ministry. I don't know. I would question that. Uh, I think that Saul had it in mind, don't you, that he would be the number one preacher to the Jews. I mean, he, he would be like, come on, look at me, you know. I'm the guy. My job is to open their eyes. Even if I have to use a crowbar, I'm going to do it. Uh, I think it would have been nice if we'd have read someplace in here where Saul began to say, I increased in love. Huh? You know, uh, back in, uh, it was probably 87, yeah, it was probably in 87. I went to a Bible study. And uh, that was with Mike and Judy Orlando. And I remember it like it was yesterday. Mike was teaching from the book of Matthew. 
And uh, I felt even back then that I had uh, a certain knowledge of the Word of God. But I remember hearing Mike preach and teach. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, I don't think I've even shared this with anybody. I thought to myself, oh, that's what's missing from my ministry, the love of God. Because Mike had it in shovelfuls. <laughs> he had it loaded up, didn't he? And so I think maybe Saul of Tarsus needs to grab a hold of that here as well. So look at 25. Then the disciples took him by night. It almost seems like, you know, they took him by force by night. <laughs> it feels a little bit that way to me. I don't want to read into the text. But it says the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall uh, in a large basket. <laughs> All right, I want you to think of this for yourself. You just came to faith in Christ. You are so excited about the word of God that you just cannot not talk about Jesus. And you find out that all those people that you're talking to about Jesus now have plotted to kill you. And so here the believers come over to your house at nighttime and they say, Saul, <laughs> you're coming with us. And they stuff you in a basket. <laughs> He's literally a basket case at this point. <laughs> and they let him down, you know, uh, over a wall <laughs> in a basket. And there he gets, well, what's that old song, the old Beatles song? Is it a Beatles song? I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> That's what's happening here to Saul, the brand new believer. So poor Saul, uh, what do you think is going on in his heart? I mean, you know, it's dark in that basket and he's stuffed in it. Uh, you could say of him right here, literally, that the church let him down. <laughs> right? <laughs> Picture that ride down in a basket. Couldn't have been comfortable. Uh, he might have been thinking, how could this be happening to me? They all know that I'm right. <laughs> I put my heart and my soul into preaching i wrestled with them with all my might and just look at me now and i have to ask have you ever felt that way because i don't think paul the apostle is the first one to ever felt let down in ministry to be let down in church and by the church so he's suffering. His heart is broken. Perhaps you've wanted to do something for the Lord. But it just didn't happen. Perhaps you wanted to serve someplace in the church. And it just was not right. Or maybe it was right. But maybe it wasn't the right time. I think that's mixed into this brand new believer, Saul. Verse 26 says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, watch this, he tried to join. Do you see that? <laughs> this is like really sad. When Saul came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So not only is the world trying to kill him, but the church will have nothing to do with him. <laughs> this is rough, isn't it? For a brand new believer, Saul. Doesn't this look like from bad to worse? Saul had been such a cruel enemy of the disciples and of the Lord that at this point, his name frankly was Mud. Imagine the looks that he got from the world, from the Jews, and from the believers. And I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you've gotten looks 
from the world and from the church, from believers, and you go, I did not deserve that. It happens. It happens in this fallen world. His conversion to Jesus Christ was real indeed, but it was also recent. And so his trust factor, his character was unproven. And there's only one answer to that, and that is time and consistency. I can't tell you the number of times that people have come up to me, even in our church family, over the years, and have said, okay, I'm ready to start a Bible study now. I don't even know them. I mean, more than, I mean, a handful of times this has happened. I've even had people show up on a Sunday who I never met and said, boy, I'd sure like to play with your worship band today. And I'd be like, uh, <laughs> who are you, you know? All it takes is time and consistency. That's why I say, wherever God plants you, grow there. Flourish there. Be led there. Get involved there. Join with those who encourage others in their faith. I mean, we have some encouragers here in the church family that are just exceptional at it. I, I just am shocked when I see it and I go well, how do they do that you know they just they just step right into people's lives and they just encourage them I think somebody who has the gift of encouragement also has this uh, ability to spot people that God wants to use and that they're not at their full potential and so an encourager has the ability to look at somebody and say, oh my goodness, God wants to use your life. And I know that you're not quite at your full potential. Oh, let God use you. Use you. Oh, let God bless you. Oh, plug in. Oh, stay, you know. Because I, you know, I hate to see that. Say this, none, no, none of you here, <laughs> and hopefully none of you watching online, but I have seen what you call a flash in the pan, Christian. Anybody seen that? Their devotion lasts for about a week and a half, <laughs> you know? And then that's it. Don't be a flash in the pan, Christian. Confirm. This breath I just breathed, it belongs to Jesus and every breath after until the day takes me home. It's Jesus in my life. Like they say, Teen Challenge. It's Jesus, breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day, right? What they have out in the wilderness? Manna, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And Jesus is the bread of life, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So, to have character, to have trust, it takes time and it takes consistency. And this next part, absolutely love it. It blows my mind. Verse 27 says, but Barnabas. That's so cool. A number of times in the scriptures you'll read, thus and so happened, and then it'll say, but God, right? Steps in and does something. This is almost like this. Because God uses Barnabas, the son of encouragement. That's what his name means. He goes, but Barnabas. So all else is falling apart in Saul's life. All attempts at ministry have failed, both in Damascus and now in Jerusalem, the disciples want nothing to do with the guy <laughs> but Barnabas. See, that's the other thing an encourager can do. An encourager has the ability to spot Christians that are wiped out and to come alongside, put their hand on their shoulder, just like Ananias did, and say, brother, let me pray for you. That's such a cool gift. But Barnabas took him, it almost seems by force again, doesn't it? Barnabas grabbed a hold of Saul and he said, Saul, you're coming with me right now. And he brought him to the apostles. And Barnabas declared to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him 
and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. What an awesome gift from God to this young Christian by the name of Saul. You may be that older brother or sister that can come along at a time of hurt and be a Barnabas to somebody in your life. This is a case of brotherly love. This is a case, once again, of where Saul gets by with a little help from his friends. <laughs> now, we again have clear statements that, uh, that Saul uh, went to the Arabian desert for three years. Now, hotly debated is whether he uh, went directly from Damascus down to Jerusalem or if he went from Damascus to the Arabian Desert and then to uh, Jerusalem. But I think those hot debates are silly because really the only thing, it doesn't matter <laughs> whether he took the long route or the short route uh, from Damascus. What does matter though is when he does show up, the apostles do not believe him. <laughs> Here he is telling them that he's saved and they're like, we don't believe you at all. It doesn't matter. So, as for wonderful Barnabas, the brother with the gift of encouragement, they did believe him. They believed him about Saul. They believed him about the encouragement, so much so that, look at verse 28. So he was with them, that is Saul, with Barnabas and the apostles. He was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. So after service, they said, why don't you go to lunch with us or dinner, you know? They hung out with him. They started having fellowship with him. This is a good thing. The apostles, after hearing Saul's testimony from Saul and Barnabas standing up for him, Saul is now included in the fellowship of the believers in Jerusalem. This tells me, again, how seriously much we need the gift of encouragement. And listen to me, we need those in the church who have this idea that their position in the church is to lift up others past them. Let me give you a help up right past me. <laughs> God wants that. He needs you at times to be the wind beneath the wings of other believers. That's a true blue ministry from Jesus Christ. It's a vital part of church life. And I would want each of us, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, to take on that role for each other at various times. Listen to what Jude wrote, the half-brother of Jesus, one of the sons of Mary, by Joseph. Jude 20 and 21, New Living Translation. But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. Catch that. By you encouraging and giving love to others, it will keep you safe in God's love. Don't cut off the flow. You're to flow with God's love for each other and encouragement for each other. Don't cut it off. If you don't cut it off, you'll keep yourself safe in God's love. Look at verse 29. Let's see what Saul gets into next. He talked and debated. Don't you kind of go, oops, careful here. As soon as, you, as soon as I read debated, I was like, oh boy. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. <laughs> okay, dear Saul, he's a powerhouse. He definitely speaks with boldness about Jesus. However, these would not accept Jesus Christ as Savior. Look, when the believers... When the believers learned of this, they took him. So you see, you have a lot of people taking Saul from one place to another, right? 
The believers in Damascus took him and put him in a basket. <laughs> here, Barnabas takes him and says he's okay. But then here, the believers take him down to Caesarea. They get him out of town by sundown. And they send him off to Tarsus. Anybody know where Tarsus is as far as Saul is concerned? That's his hometown, right? So I look at this and I say, okay, in all of this, one thing is for sure. God never stops working on Saul, does he? Doesn't stop working on Saul. And he never stops working on you. <laughs> and he never stops working on me. He just, God has no quit in him in regards to you and your life. And he will continue working on you and your parenting and your being a child and your being an adult and your being a friend and your being a musician and whatever it is that God has called you to do, uh, you know, whatever deacon, elder, you know, usher, whatever your job is in the church, overheads, sound team, God will keep on working in your life. Uh, you might think, well, things have got to get better for Saul here, right? <laughs> Don't count on it, huh? Now we know that Tarsus is his hometown. So here's the picture. Watch this. Here's the picture. Saul's in the church family. And somebody comes up to Saul and goes, uh, Brother Saul, I just wanted to let you know that the whole church family, we've taken up a collection. And here's your one-way ticket home. <laughs> Isn't that what you said? Isn't that the picture? <laughs> Verse 31. It says, then, when Saul's out of town, what does it say? 31. We're going to end here. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multi multiplied. All right, Saul makes it back to Tarsus and he gets in the mail a postcard. And the postcard <laughs> reads, Dear Saul, ever since you left, peace has broken out everywhere. Since you've been gone, we're just so blessed in the faith and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> right? It kind of seems that way, doesn't it? I mean, I don't want to read too much between the lines. But what happens to Saul now? Saul goes to a home church family. And there he learns how to become a servant. Oh my goodness. What does that require? Humbling, doesn't it? You know? I'll tell you. You may... You may, you know, push against it. But one of the very best things that God can do in your life is to humble you before him. Is to absolutely humble you before him. Because at the point that you are humbled before God, you're now teachable. You're now usable. Because the person who is continually proud before God says, I got this. I can do that. I can handle it. I think Saul was doing that. He was saying, my education, my pedigree, you know. <laughs> I was on the Sanhedrin. I know more scriptures than anybody. I can confound you all with my wisdom. And I think he had to learn that the real key and the real goal is not your ability, not my ability, not your education, not your position. Your strength is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, that's the hope. That's what wins. I guess you could say that's the ticket. That's the ticket for, for uh, Saul, young believer Saul. Let me read to you what Saul, later to become Paul the Apostle, would end up writing. This is in Philippians chapter 3. Verses 7 through 9. He ends up saying this about all his wisdom and knowledge and education and position. And he says, But what things were gain to me, 
These things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That's what we want. That's what we need. That's how you can serve God and not be let down and not become a basket case. If I would want you to take away anything from this lesson um, on top of or in accordance with whatever the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you as I've shared this, what I want you to walk away with, a couple of things. Number one, don't be surprised if your growth towards Christian maturity is a bumpy ride because that seems to be the norm. Amen? And number two, the ministry of encouragement is for all of us and is vital for every church family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this afternoon and for my beautiful, blessed brothers and sisters that you have brought here and that you've brought online and that will see this message later. Bless them all, Lord God. Let them know your great love for them, that you'll never leave them, you'll never forsake them, and you'll never stop working in their lives. Use our lives, Father, for your glory and for our good. We bow humbly before you, Lord, counting on Christ, our only hope of glory. For we pray all these things in Jesus' wonderful name. And all my dear brothers and sisters say, Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up.